So I want to thank all of you for joining in with us today. This is, as you I'm sure we're all aware, um, our November issue of the B Biogeography and Systematics Talks. This is a monthly international webinar series uh, presented by the Packer Lab at York University, as well as the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation. Uh, my name is Victoria McPhail. I'm the coordinator of the BEC uh, group. So if you're not familiar, this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. And so each platform is a little bit different. In this situation, only panelists can turn the camera and microphones on. So if you have a question or a comment to share, uh, please use the Q&A box for to post questions. And the chat box we use for general sort of comments that like we're sharing right now, where you're from and what the weather is like. If you have any trouble during this presentation, for, you know, for whatever reason, you can message me uh, through the chat feature as the host, or you can email me directly at bc at yorku.ca. Uh, Dr. Close has given permission to record this presentation, so we post it online later to our YouTube channel, which we encourage you to follow along anyways, get notifications whenever we do post new talks. And I want to recognize that we have an indigenous, um, we have territory acknowledgement statement I'd like to share, I'd like to reflect, I encourage all of you to reflect on the areas that you live in. And for York University, our statement is, we recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tikranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wandat, and the Métis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And recognizes this territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampon Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. As I mentioned, we are all located in different parts of the world, and I encourage you to check out this website, www.native-land.ca, to learn more about the Indigenous peoples who have caretaken the land in the past and in the present in your area. And for this, I want to turn things over to Dr. Packer to introduce our speaker, Dr. Close Russ, uh, sorry, Russ Moosen. Apologies, Close, if I mis mispronounced that. No, oh, hello, everybody. I am talking to you from a hair salon in England where my niece well, works in my brother's house. And that's why I've got this strange thing behind me, because that's where people get their hair washed. Um, I have to thank Klaus Rasmussen especially enthusiastically today because at this minute his nation's football club is playing Australian in the World Cup, Australia in the World Cup, and they have to win if they're going to get through to the next round. So um, he's most generous with his time, and I apologise for the timing of this being unknown to me and Klaus at the time we book this uh, coinciding with this nationally important event for him. Anyway, Klaus Rasmussen is an assistant professor um, at the University of Aachen in Denmark. Uh, he's worked with wild bees since 1997. He has extensive experience rearing bees and studying their behavior and ecology and a solid training in molecular studies. Uh, and uh, during his PhD and postdocs. Uh, research questions in recent years have circled around the effects of climate change on pollination networks, competition between wild bees and honeybees, and increasing biodiversity in the agricultural landscape. He's done a lot of field work, the lucky man, in Peru, for which he has a particular knowledge about the interesting bee fauna there. So with no further ado, I will pass this over to the competent hands of Klaus Rasmussen to tell us about bees north and south. Thank you very much, Lawrence. I hope I go uh, through now and uh, I look forward to see how you look like uh, when the talk is over at that hair <laughs> saloon. But uh, <laughs> thanks again for the invitation and uh, I, I can't make any difference uh, for, the, for the football game tonight. So we'll just uh, turn back and, and see how it went later on. But as uh, Lawrence mentioned, my name is uh, Klaus Rasmussen. I work here at the Institute of uh, Department of Agroecology at Aarhus University. 
And my talk will take you through at least some of the activities I've uh, spent time on for the for the last many years. And of course, I with the time constraints and everything, I miss out many exciting ones. So if you're interested in reading more about those I talk about or those that I missed, you're welcome to visit my uh, university web page or Google Scholar Research Gates, where everything is uh, is listed. This is uh, the campus area. It's uh, our beautiful main campus uh, near the port of uh, the uh, in the city of uh, Aarhus. By Danish standards, it's a very big city. It's the second largest, 636,000 inhabitants. And as a curious side note, the 88% of us owns a bike, so it's it's a bike city. But uh, we have a about uh, 30,000 students enrolled here in, in the in the campus area, which is uh, within the city is, is nice having uh, green areas, although not as much nature as might be interesting for us. But agroecology is, is actually located uh, not within the main campus, but because of the, the field sites and uh, the facilities we have, it's located where the two areas are in uh, Bolum and in Plagerbier, a bit far from, from Aarhus. But this is where agroecology is located. And besides this, we have a, a number of other uh, locations, Aarhus University, some even uh, in Greenland. As mentioned by uh, by Lawrence, my, my tenure into uh, bees started far away from Denmark. It was actually in the 95, I took a half a year off from my studies to join the 50 hectare plots measuring trees in the Yasuni National Reserve in Ecuador, just uh, just measuring trees uh, day in and out. And what you can not really see on this picture, but if you zoom in on my arms, you see it's uh, dotted black and it was stingless bees crawling all over me. Uh, Day out, day uh, day in, almost as uh, we were always sweating in in the forest, hiking around, and I'm uh, well equipped with my my dagger for self defense. But what maybe was most fascinating to me to learn was from uh, the the people in the area, the native people in the area, was that these bees that I would uh, be pestered from day in and day out, they actually produce a very delicious honey. I couldn't really. Uh, uh, get my head around that at least for the for the time being I wasn't able to try it at the time but I noticed where they uh, got most of the resources from at least but uh, back from uh, Ecuador I started to uh, work into my thesis and and first looked at the bees in Denmark before I, I took on to do my master thesis in the tropics again but here I am back from uh, Ecuador and, and you see we have a lot of trees, there's snow on them, so it's not really a habitat for stingless bees, it's something uh, much, <clears throat> much less tropical. Here are some of the main representatives of our uh, Danish bee fauna. It's a uh, typical, what you would see in uh, these cooler Palearctic regions, uh, two uh, species of the genus Andrina. We have uh, 64 species of Andrina in Denmark. Then we have a lot of, uh, of course, the kleptoparasitic species associated with the Andrina, the Nomada. There are 36 species of Nomada, then 29 species of bumblebees, and uh, of course, a lot of uh, small leisure blossom species as well. So this this would be uh, the some of the very, very uh, key components of our Danish bee fauna. <clears throat> This is uh, a map of Denmark. There's the, the, the flag. The size of Denmark is uh, it's 40, close to 43,000 square kilometers. So it's about half the size of uh, South Carolina. Not very big, but we have uh, up here in the north, 300 species, close to 300 different species of uh, bees recorded over time. So maybe we can't find 300 just now, but they at least have been uh, at one point in time uh, in Denmark. As for knowledge about the bees in Denmark, usually we divide the country into 11 faunistic uh, zones. So this small country, you divide it into uh, 
depending on the on the type of uh, soil and uh, the formation uh, and everything you could divide it into 11 different faunistic regions and that's what is uh, shown here on the graphic to the left it's uh, enumerating the number of uh, species known from each of these 11 regions there's a uh, the, the, the first part of it is uh, both periods. So that's uh, recorded both historically and in more recent time. Then we have one that's followed, which is uh, only recorded in recent time and, and the top bar is uh, only in uh, historic time, historic time being uh, before 1975. Well, for Hymenoptera, at least the bees are fairly well known and it's fairly well known across the Denmark you uh, you might say, of course, it's not at all comparable to, to mammals or birds or, or some of the well-known uh, insects like butterflies, but but bees is fairly well known to uh, in Denmark, or at least fairly well characterized compared to so many other countries. And uh, one region I have been uh, particularly fascinated about is uh, the red arrow down here. That's the fourth largest island in Denmark it's called Lolland. And I have encircled it. So we there's a historical record of a little more than 200 species from, from this island. Why this is uh, key or interesting is because of Lauritz Jansen. Lauritz Jansen was a school teacher. He's, he uh, lived in the house, he's shown here. And uh, his school was the same size. So you could say this was his school and his house. But back uh, 101 years ago, he published uh, our so far only uh, monograph of, about bees in Denmark, uh, simply called bees. He would uh, list all the species, record their, their phenology, their foraging behavior, and provide keys for their uh, identification. But what's interesting is, of course, uh, that the man also kept his bees until uh, an old age where they were donated to the museum. So it's possible to track back, go back, look at what he had around his house at this time. And that's exactly what I'm doing here on the left. I'm visiting the very same area and I'm uh, resampling together with uh, a number of uh, colleagues and uh, expert citizen scientists. We went back and, and visited. Just briefly, there were 203 species in, uh, in total, both historical and recent records. Lowitz was uh, more efficient. He lived there. He lived there for a very long period and was able to uh, go out every time the sun was shining. We were more, a bit more limited because it's a, uh, it's a long trip to the to the island by Danish standards, at least. He had uh, eighty-two species that were unique to his period. That is eighty-two species that we didn't see at all, although we had twenty-nine species that he didn't see. So there's some difference. But the, the newcomers didn't really make up for the decline or the lack of uh, species in, in the old age. So maybe there are some kind of uh, decline going on. And uh, maybe it could be uh, Lolland, like all of the country is uh, heavily dominated by agriculture. We have 60% uh, of our land surface is agriculture, about 10% in nature and, and very little of uh, that nature is uh, present in on the island of Lolland, so it's it's a heavily cultivated area. But um, maybe with some of the uh, particularly interesting flora at the time of uh, Jørgensen, and we were lucky, we were able to uh, revisit the bees from Jørgensen to recover the pollen loads that they had, identify that pollen, and this is the results. This is a picture of all of the plants over time. Uh, on my screen, I, I can't see it because uh, the names are listed in the right side. But below, if, if you have the same setup as me, below that you'll see that the color coding is uh, the yellow uh, bars in front represent the month of April. The next is the month of May. So you also have the phenology represented in this graphic and just just if we look at the early bees, for example, they in Denmark, they all go to Salix, and that's what we see in the, in the family Celiaceae. Then the next important source for many of the early Andrina species, that's a dandelion, that's in within the family Asteraceae, and, and these boom out. So 
we didn't really see anything that was uh, missing here. It, it looked completely like what we would uh, see today. We also looked at the specialist uh, uh, bees, those that were more specialized and had particular um, foraging needs. Uh, and we didn't see anything that was uh, missing amongst those, uh, including, for example, Campanula, the, that were both uh, an important resource for specialist bees at the time of Jørgensen, but also in, in, in modern time. Of course, we do not have, unfortunately, quantitative data, so we can't say much about the abundance at the time, but at least it, we couldn't see if anything was present. Then we looked into, uh, well, maybe it's uh, some of the life history traits, and we looked at those that were unique to the early period and those that were unique to the recent period. Parasitic behavior, unique, uh, this is percentage. So those that were unique at that time, 17%, those that are unique to the new period is, is 41%. So at least there's a, there's a marked difference. The same with the oligolectic. It's, uh, it was at the time of Jørgensen, those that are unique to this period, that's uh, what we didn't find later on. It's close to 40% unique. Uh, oligolectic, oligolectic, I didn't mention it uh, when they're specialized to just a few different families of, uh, uh, of uh, plant families they can uh, they collect pollen from for their for their uh, uh, root cells. Whereas the polylectic, they have a wide range of pollen sources they can use for their uh, for feeding their larvae for provisioning their larvae. So there's a, there's a difference there, a particular uh, parasitic species arrived in the recent time and oligolectic species apparently accounted for the loss. So that we thought was, uh, was rather interesting. And we also tested this, of course, and the probability of being extant in the new period is much lower if you were a specialist bee, if you were an oligolectic bee as, as opposed to polylectic uh, bee. So, we were fascinated, but of course, this is a, a repeat issue with a, a, a study taking a data that wasn't really collected uh, in a systematic way and uh, not really a, with a defined protocol. And 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 there would be many uh, issues of of comparing this. But this this was the one of the things we looked at and uh, and found. We also thought maybe it's a there is an issue of competition. Competition has been uh, a major element in the literature in, in the last 15 years, maybe competition with the Western honeybee, the Apis mellifera and other bees. And of course, uh, the, the idea is that either there is uh, no uh, foraging overlap and then we have no competition or there's a very large overlap and we have a lot of competition. But it could also be, and that's probably mostly the case, that it's a more context-dependent competition. And we were very uh, curious if uh, the piece in Denmark, Denmark also would uh, compete for resources with the honeybees, given that the honeybees is really native to Denmark. It's not kept in its native way in the, in the uh, feral in, in the forest. It's a, it's a managed bee by today's standard but we we didn't think we could compare just uh, one bee against 300 other species of bees so what we did was we tried to do a one one by one comparison every single species of of, of bee in, in Denmark had to be compared to the foraging resources uh, they share with the, the honey bee and that's what we did we just got all of the data we we could find on the Danish species of bees, all the different uh, uh, plant resources they use. And what we found was uh, actually there's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of plant genera. We didn't look at plant species because specialization is usually at a, at a much higher level than species. And and according to the old Robertson papers, there isn't. It's more a theoretical idea that you have a specialist on a single plant species. It's it's at a generic level or higher level that they are specialized. So we 
we looked at uh, at plant genera and and found that the honeybees use uh, close to 300 different plant genera. The other bees use close to 300 plant genera. The overlap here is uh, 176 plant genera that both wild bees, both uh, non-apis bees and apis mellifera use in, in Denmark. But how should we uh, use this information? The idea was then, well, we try and score them by the red list status. The, IUCN red list categories are, uh, are known for all of the Danish species. They have been scored by a, 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 a colleague uh, here in Denmark. So we know the, the status of each of these species. If we compare the status of the species with the foraging overlap, maybe we see a trend, maybe, maybe their status of being endangered is, uh, is, uh, or threatened is uh, is something that's driven by the honeybee. So we compared it. And what you see here in the in the very first uh, column, for example, that's the resource overlap of one to ten percent. So that's you could say that's that's hardly any overlap with the honeybees. And still, what you see is uh, you have two that are regional extinct. That's the purple color. Then that follows the endangered. That's two species. Then we have three species that are vulnerable, one species uh, that's uh, near threatened, one species least threatened, least concerned, and then we have uh, three that are not applicable. Not applicable, that's just a category for those species that have been recorded in Denmark, but they are not considered to be uh, breeding here. So they in a, in a period of uh, more than 10 years. So, so they may just be stray animals uh, flying in from uh, on a single location or a few occasions from Germany or Poland, but they haven't really established themselves here. And what was important here is to note that the colors, they are really consistent throughout this, this graphic. It's, it's not something that you see that it's driven toward a, a trend in, in either of the other one. So clearly there wasn't any relationship be between uh, their conservation status and the resource overlap, which is uh, good at least there. Uh, that's that's not to worry too much about. We also looked at life history traits like uh, being specialized, polylectic, oligolectic. Did that mean anything? Parasitic, parasitic, because they they still use uh, resources, uh, nectar resources. Would that overlap with uh, with honeybee mean anything? No, it, it there wasn't really anything. Yet. But still, in order to provide some uh, background for. Uh, uh, agencies, conservation agencies, or land management uh, planners, we, we came up with a solution where at least being threatened, that's whether the, whether being uh, threatened by uh, habitat loss or, or anything else, being threatened is, is of concern, of course. And if being threatened at the same time, having a major uh, foraging overlap, niche overlap with the honeybees, then those species could be of particular concern. So we were able to nail down the 30 species in Denmark that would be of concern if they are co-occurring in a, for example, a natural area with the honeybees. And the table here is uh, divided in, and particularly, of course, we were worried about the being specialist, then you have much less alternatives to go through than, uh, than, than any of the other categories. So the oligolectic species with a 70% or more overlap with the honeybees, those were the ones that we would be particularly concerned. But all of those that are threatened are really very uh, narrowly distributed in, in Denmark. So it's not a widespread problem, but we uh, at least were able to identify them and can take this into account in in uh, future land planning. But uh, just uh, let's move away from Denmark. You are from all over the, the, the country we saw in, in the beginning. And some of uh, what I found very inspiring in, in the beginning of uh, reading up on these was the a particular paper by Michner on from 1979 on biogeography. And, and he wrote, just uh, read up here, it says, uh, there's some evidence that solitary to primitively social bees that nest in wood or stems are more likely to cross modern water gaps than are those that nest in the ground. 
And I thought, yeah, that makes good sense because you can't just float away if you are nesting in the ground. But uh, what is the evidence and, and what is the impact? Because really in Denmark, and uh, when we count it up, 54% of our species here nest in soil, 17% nest in sticks. And if I do enumerate the global, it's fairly similar. So you could say that the potential is, uh, is, is, is much higher if you were a ground nesting, but it's that they are limited at the same time for uh, dispersal. What we came up with uh, uh, a, a colleague was was this. We just looked at the islands, looked at the, the bee fauna on the islands, compared that to the closest mainland, and, and then looked at how different are those islands. We only looked at the continental islands and oceanic islands. So that's islands that would not have a history of connection with the mainland would have uh, confounded the, the results here. We looked at this and, and found that the deviation, what you would have expected on an island if you go 4,000 kilometers away is that you would have 50% more stick uh, nesting bees than, than otherwise uh, expected just by comparing to the mainland. So certainly, of course, Mitzner was right. We, do, we just thought it was uh, interesting to try and, and document and, and see what the effect actually was. And uh, this was uh, uh, as some addition to that story or some, some data. But when we uh, move away 4,000 kilometers or, or move away as, as far as possible, I think the most remote place I can think about is, uh, is the northern part of Greenland, where I spent two, uh, two seasons uh, looking at the uh, pollinators this is a uh, pictures from there and uh, it's me in the lower left corner doing field work it, the, the vegetation is low so actually you have to be close and uh, this is past midnight the summer season is just so short so intense that it's uh, and there's sunlight uh, day and night so why uh, waste your time not being active and that's what the insects and uh, and the plants are doing uh, day in and day out during the summertime, and maybe, uh, uh, or my interest, particular interest here was uh, the some of the response that could be uh, seen in in uh, seen to climate change, and the ideas or the observation is that particularly towards the poles, any of the climate change, any of the increases in temperature is, is much higher there than anywhere else. And some of the, or the three general rules of uh, adaptation to climate changes, so or not adaptation, the, the response to climate changes, uh, either you move towards the pole or what if you can go up hills. There's an earlier timing of life history uh, events. So you also es escape uh, that. And then you have the body size change because uh, when it gets warmer, the maturity is reached earlier for insects. So they, they actually reduce the body size. But I was particularly interested in uh, in this, the timing of the life history events. I uh, I did look at, at bees. There are actually bees up there. This is the subgenus Alpino bumbus. There's just, just two species. So uh, now you have all made it already uh, passed the, the course in the uh, high arctic uh, bee fauna. There's uh, one species that's called Polaris. And then there's another species in the in the subgenus that uh, used to be called Hyperboreus in, in uh, the Northeastern Greenland, but in a recent paper with uh, Paul Williams, it's uh, now called Nadvigi. Nadvigi is a little special. They look, they actually look very much the same. They have the same basic uh, color pattern, but Nadvigi is a bit special because it's uh, take over the nest of uh, Polaris, maybe as an adaptation to the very short season, they, they figure that they, they can't, uh, they don't have the time to build up a nest uh, colony, and the, so they just take over and, and kill the queens of uh, Polaris and take over that nest. But that's just uh, two of the species uh, in a pollination network because the main pollinator on uh, in these high Arctic area are really uh, small flies. 
as uh, music flies like like this one this is uh, this is a key element in uh, in uh, in a high actic uh, pollinator network what i did was i i mainly collected daily plant and insect interactions these interactions they are represented in this matrix here on the on the x-axis, you have the plants. Everyone represent a different plant species. And then down on the i-axis, you have uh, the different species of pollinators. There were more than twice as many pollinators as plants. So that's why it's uh, not uh, a square, but uh, has this form. Every dot represents an interaction. So that means the pollinator visit that particular species of, of plant. and. Uh, this pattern that you see here, that's actually a universal for, for these interactions. Uh, you have a core area up in the left corner. So those are the species uh, interacting with many members of the network. That's where you have the many dots. And then you have two tails. One tail is very short in this one, but those are species interacting with few other, few of the core members in particular of the network. So that's a, that's the typical nested uh, structure of these uh, in pollination or interaction networks. And for long, it's been known that the tail represent really a functional redundancy because they are all having the same function in, in this ecosystem. They are providing the same uh, uh, ecosystem services. So the the missing a few of these shouldn't really matter too much. But uh, that was interesting. This is this is the compiled data set from the, from the entire season. When I slice that up into smaller networks, temporal networks, so you could say at a weekly basis or a daily basis even, and looking, for example, at the sexy fraga, it looks a little bit different. Then we do not have a, a, a tail that runs throughout the time, we have these uh, temporal segregated uh, elements. What what you have here in, in the top uh, red bar is uh, that's the, the period that you have the flowering from day 179 to day 230, I think. And then you have the, uh, the phenophase, the period that the, the visiting insects were active. And what you see that they have their spread spread over time, they they come and replace each other, it almost looks like. So if we just looked at the tail, there were different, uh, 14 different uh, tail pollinator for this species, but at the mean daily, there were only available 2.6 different uh, the species. And uh, we tested if this was random. If this was random, it would be the, called the mid-domain problem or the one dimensional pencil box effect. So if you sh shake your pencil box, they're not just distributed from one end to the other end. They're mostly arranged around the middle. And that's where you were expecting with these pollinators, but that's not the case. They're spread out much more. This is a, another look at the, at the high Arctic communities and uh, um, here we have enlisted the plant flowering duration. So that's when the plants start flowering until senescence and, and you have the dropping of, 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 the, of, the, of the flowers. That's listed in green. This is over time, over different years. And on the, on, uh, the height of this is the timing of the phenological event. It's called the day of year. So it's just counting from the uh, 1st of January and on. And what you see is uh, for the plants, the plant flowering duration, it has been, uh, it has advanced, it's coming earlier, but it's also shorter. So that means that duration is shorter over time. As opposed to the to the pollinators, the gray area it hasn't really advanced. There's there's much less response there. It's it's also uh, uh, 
it hasn't advanced and it hasn't been uh, shorter. But what we found was that the overlap, the warmer the, the season gets, the overlap decreases, meaning that there could be some disruption of, uh, of this uh, interaction if climatic change continues with the, with the warming. But I, I, it's kind of cold here in, in Denmark, so I would like to take you uh, away from Greenland and down to the tropics. That's where the stingless bees are, are found. The stingless bees are roughly within the red there's square here, and that's has been another major group of uh, my uh, my study interest for uh, for years. And stingless bees are easily recognized. They have a cubicula just like uh, honeybees, a uh, pollen basket. They are indeed stingless. This is the largest species. It's just sitting on my finger. They're biting, but they can't sting. They're social. They have a highly social uh, structure independently involved from, from the honeybee. And that's what you see here. This is the smallest of the stingless bee in a nesting in a sugar cane between the internose of a sugar cane. Uh, they have, uh, because they're social, they of course have a very efficient recruitment uh, communication system as well. This is a photographer just like me and uh, Yasuni covered in stingless bees and the mosquito net is probably not because of mosquitoes, but rather because of, of the stingless bees. I have kept these uh, bees myself. Also, the pictures here on the top left is uh, 20 years ago and, and the other one is from uh, July this year. So. I uh, maintain some of these colonies uh, have been in my possession for uh, for many years, and I have only developed a little bit on the style of, uh, of keeping them. But still, this is, has been uh, very inspiring as a living lab for me, and I have used them for studying honey properties, uh, nesting behavior, both uh, published and unpublished uh, systematics. Many of the specimens that I used for my PhD came from uh, from these hives and taxonomy describing new species and converges and 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 honey sale also originates for this. And actually we know a lot about the, the stingless bees, their nest and the substrates and uh, and uh, the differences in in uh, in their uh, living. But any of these differences couldn't really be studied without having a good uh, phylogeny. So I was very inspired to, to start on that with uh, my PhD and Sydney Cameron in uh, 2003. And this is this is the real starting phylogeny of uh, my PhD studies. It represents just about uh, all of the major groups of uh, stingless bees in the group. And if we were to uh, pin in on a on a few of the details, it's uh, separate the the this uh, group of uh, bees into three major groups. One that I called and paint here green, the New World. So that's uh, South and Central America. All of the species and genera from that region uh, have a common evolutionary history. They are in the same clade as does the old world uh, species divided further into an Indo Malay Australasian clade and an Afrotropical clade. The Afrotropical clade, a few of those uh, eventually at a later point after the original split went back into Southeast Asia. And one of the more curious thing may be, uh, uh, but in, relevant for uh, at least uh, systematists is that in, in many parts of uh, this uh, into Malay, Australasian region, they were recording trigona uh, because uh, previous studies had, had shown that uh, this was a widespread genus, but I showed here in my phylogeny that it's, uh, it, it's really polyphyletic both within the new world, but also with the old world uh, species that they, are, they do not share the same uh, common evolutionary history. It's, it's separate events, and therefore they should not be uh, named with the same uh, genus name, Trigona. And what confounded people was some of the, the traits, morphological traits, the chyotrichia, which is on the inner side of the hintibia, and in these that were named Trigona is on a very narrow ridge uh, with a behind a, a blank uh, depressed area. Whereas for all of the other species of uh, stainless bees, 
they don't have this uh, ridge where the keratrichia is on. It's it's much more widespread. So at least we uh, resolved that and uh, had uh, renamed a lot of groups. So that's why you shouldn't uh, see trigona anymore for uh, species from the old world, at least. Another minor detail here is a uh, genial trigona that came out to uh, two different places in the phylogeny. And, and I, I thought that was uh, interesting because it's uh, it was described as being a uh, several species in in this one genus Genio trigona but we showed that they were morphological and molecularly very distinct belong to different places and because the one that was misplaced was found across the Wallace line we are named this after Alfred Russell Wallace so that's uh, that's his little bee Another thing you can look with uh, a phylogeny and, and, and studying the history is uh, are the fossils. So we have a lot of fossils, or not a lot. We have some fossils of stainless bees, both in uh, Dominican amber from New Jersey, amber from the uh, Baltic, amber from uh, Sicily. So, so there's a possibility to, uh, to place these specimens in the phylogeny calibrated uh, using it as a up or a lower or, or, or fixed edges on the phylogeny. And then having this molecular clock, clock because we have the different mutation rates, have them calibrated, uh, construct a, a chronogram that, that shows the, the timing of the different splits of, of the stainless bees. And uh, they go back a, a long time in time. This is a, uh, this is the KG boundary, so that's uh, that's the end of the dinosaur age at the uh, 65 million years of of age. But we came to the conclusion that the stingless bees, the split between the new and old world, were 81 million years uh, ago. And while that seems uh, a bit old compared to other studies uh, that has been made at the uh, on, on, on bees, it's it's really difficult to believe it could be anything less than that. Because South America, which is a key area that has a lot of diversity, most of the diversity of both genera and species has been so isolated for a very long time. And it was actually split away 80 million years ago uh, when we had this split between the old world and the new world fauna of, of stingless bees, but at least botanical evidence show that there were some land bridges, some uh, some uh, islands that could have functioned maybe as a stepping stone for the stingless bees to continue genetic uh, interchange between South America and, and this Afrotropical region. But Colitids often they uh, refer to a very important land bridge uh, from South America over Antarctic to Australia, but that's more recent. And also we, we only have a very few uh, uh, species of, of stainless bees in Australia all derived from the, from the Indo-Malay region. So it, it's, it's really the best explanation. And also for understanding this period uh, in time, there was a, a very different climate, paratropical climate in, in Europe, favoring Bees such as the tropical stingless bees in uh, in this region. So I think this this is a, a a very possible explanation. I'll just skip this one and and mention that I have also done a lot of uh, surveying. And some of the surveys are uh, in, include the uh, Peru, where, which has a lot of different. Uh, uh, life zones and therefore a lot of interesting diversity and it it's uh, of course Peru has uh, has these uh, this is a uh, dried riverbed the 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 coast they along the coast they also have these uh, the lomas which is a uh, cloud formation that that creates a habitat for uh, uh, for a lot of flowers, even though it's uh, in a desert-like area. We also have the inter-Andean valleys uh, and, the, and the higher parts, we have the, the rainforest. And one of the groups that I have spent 
a lot of time serving was uh, the orchid bees. Here I am serving in uh, in near Iquitos in a white sand area. I compared three different areas. One was a pristine forest. One was uh, down here where I stand. Is uh, that's a reforested area, so that's in process of uh, regaining its uh, natural value. And then we have some uh, a bit more trash like uh, areas, like uh, up here in the top left. I collected uh, several thousand uh, specimens of orchid bees, and I couldn't find any difference between the habitats. They they came out being equally uh, diverse and abundant uh, with say what test I took. And maybe it's because even at this time, it's not like Manaus, which is a more isolated uh, habitats. There was still there was still a, a surrounding matrix of nature. And that's probably why I could attract the long Flighting insects like uh, like orchid bees in 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 this part, but we also in the same area looked at uh, at stingless bees. Then we went outside. This is uh, this is all white sand area, so that's a particular habitat. It's uh, the forest is standing on white sand. We compared the non-white sand with white sand and, and found that the richness, uh, the number of species were fairly similar around 30, both for the non-white sand and the white sand areas. The abundance was much, much higher for uh, uh, the communities within the, the white sand areas. We did some further community analysis and showed that the soil type and the idea with the white sand is that it's very important for structuring the the, the, the tree community. So you have a very distinct uh, tree community in white sand versus uh, non-white sand. It was uh, interesting to look at if, if the bees would repeat this pattern, but uh, it it really showed that soil type does uh, structure the community, but uh, for white sand, at least it was also driven by the distance simply because they don't fly very long, the, the stingless bees. So the interaction we found was that between the, the soil type and the distance is, is, is equally important. And then for one of the last slides is uh, some of the difficulties in studying uh, faunistic or surveys in, in, a, in a tropical area is, uh, is, for example, this study we did in a coffee region in the northeastern Peru, uh, also close to a 2000 uh, specimen collected. We identified 180 one species, but only 80 of those, 44%, we could identify or name to a species, which gives us a high proportion of undetermined species. And the consequence is that it's simply not possible to compare the pollinator communities across studies, assess historical changes as we did with the urns, nor analyze endemism if it's just some SP that we uh, compare to, uh, to another unknown SP. And this is really key in uh, in providing a sound basis for policy makers to protect habitats for conservation of native uh, pollinators or understanding uh, how these uh, uh, or what drives their uh, decrease or increase of, of, of these species. Then I, I'll skip these historical bee persons, but the, the problem with many of those unnamed is they're not necessarily undescribed. They might be described, but because they were described so long ago and haven't really been revisited in an integrative approach, uh, producing a, a, a public key or, or photo documentation, it's very difficult to identify them. And I also want to add that doing surveys, some of the maybe most uh, fun side projects has always been uh, looking for that little uh, unknown and this includes uh, up here in the top left that's a new species that was described on this day two years ago it just said in my facebook that's a two day two year anniversary of describing this species the lower left here that's a <clears throat> that's an orchid bee nest that i stumbled into uh, in, in one of my uh, field trips uh, collected it, uh, reared it out, and, and described the nest. The other one, I just thought it was an interesting wasp collected it, and it turns out that within the wasp, there was the mantid fly that's uh, in an extremely rare genus. It was a new species also, but 
the genus was only known from a, a few specimen collected by Bates and, and, and a few other 150 years ago. So there's a lot of uh, things that you just have to be very aware of doing uh, surveys because uh, there's always something interesting to look at. And what I have doing uh, been doing for the last year, my focus has been more on more general, maybe a little more political by reversing the decline of pollinators and loss of biodiversity in general within the framework of the green transition of Danish agriculture, and particularly how climate and environmental ambitions also support our our nature, uh, native pollinators. And this is uh, our uh, our global food system in, in Denmark. And we have then tried to look into where we could uh, position biodiversity there. And with that, I would like to say, Thank you to uh, all of my collaborators and friends over the years uh, who uh, sh share my passion for the piece. And uh, I don't know if we have time for a few questions. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Yeah, we do have time for questions. Uh, thank you very much. That was a great overview of a heck of a lot of work. You've been very busy. Um, that I'm just old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I beat you on that one. Um, that mantid fly was spectacular. It's a bee mimic, eh? It's exactly. I when it just uh, came out, I thought that's that looks like a tilotragona, a type of uh, tetragona. Yeah. So they, I thought that was even more uh, incredible. But uh, I, 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 uh, and it was just by chance, just by out of curiosity, that was looked interesting. So let me read it out and uh, get a longer series and maybe record some parasites or or something that's. That's always what you hope when you uh, put them in your jars or plastic bags to see something uh, come out that you didn't expect. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that's just marvelous. Um, you know, I've never seen any neuropteran with hairy legs like that. No, no, and they are expanded. It looked just like uh, a, a scopa. So uh, they are they are fantastic. Super. Okay, so if you've got questions, please send them to the Q and A. Um, we're, that's what we're going to be looking at. You're getting a whole bunch of people saying what a great talk that was on Thank the you. chat. Um, so I, I'll ask one. You know, so given that Denmark has got so many islands, I'm wondering whether you're planning on doing any. Um, I'm wondering if you plan on doing any of the island biogeography on the Danish beach. No, not really. It would be interesting. We have 500 islands. Many of them are not inhabited at all, but but all, most of them are, are so close to the mainland that it's it's uh, they would be particularly interesting in terms of uh, some of the uninhabited because they they have uh, maybe remnants of nature or maybe they have a a skewed representation of, of the mainland fauna, so you might find some of the rare ones there. But uh, right. we have had interest in islands and, and the bigger ones that would support a larger population, most of those are, are heavily cultivated too. Right. And with cultivation comes a lot of uh, fertilization and fertilization leads to a lot of grasses and uh, who are poor bee habitat. Right. So are, are these really small islands um... I'm oh, sorry, are these uninhabited islands incredibly small? Um, well, they're, it's, they're all, all, all sizes, but... Uh, also, there are, there are some reasonable size islands with no people in them. No, I think... Uh, uh, reason, it depends on what reasonable size is, uh, but... Uh, if it's if it's uh, if it's too small, the small ones might still be interesting because uh, they they can have those uh, interesting. Some of the best bee habitats in a place like Denmark is along the coast, where you have the cliffs, the rocks. That there you have excellent nesting habitats. You also have a, a special flora that uh, thrives on on these uh, cliffs or or, or slopes and. Uh, that's really interesting. So surveying that would be interesting, but uh, it it would be uh, maybe maybe we should look at that, Lawrence. <laughs> well, then, yeah, you know, if you've got cliffs, then it, there's an interesting comparison 
with the orientation of the cliff, because you wouldn't expect too many bees on the north facing slopes no, no. in the northern hemisphere, but the south facing slopes, you'd expect more on. Okay, so one chair is wondering whether you could do that kind of work in Kenya or elsewhere in Eastern Africa. Oh, that's Muo, Muo Casino. What is the question? Oh, I can. The question is, he's, he's hoping you can uh, partner with him to work, do similar work in Kenya or in East Africa. Uh, I, I don't see it. It's in the chat. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's coming, it's coming to the chat. So he's 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 one he wish he what he says is I wish we can partner to expand this work to Kenya and East Africa. Okay, but uh, sure. Um, yeah, just get the permits. Just uh, just just send me a a message uh, more and we'll uh, figure that out. That'd be great. Um, okay, so Patricia Landa Verde is very interesting that you mentioned the fossil and stingless bees from North America, as they are specifically from the pantropics. Is there any explanation for that specimen? Um, okay, she's got some more questions. I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. No, it's a, it's that particular one is, a, well, you can say all of those that are outside of the the tropics both sicily baltic empire and new jersey they are they are outside of the typical but that's because uh, historically at that time we had this part tropical uh climate so that means uh it, it was just uh, it was just warm and humid and that's also we have some uh, compression fossils in denmark of uh, palm palm trees which which is also a uh, one that thrives in 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 the tropics we also have uh, parrots but but it's because the climate was simply different in the north back then and we uh, tend to yeah there was kind of in, on El ellesmere island there was tropical rainforest yeah. back then it's that's difficult to imagine, imagine that now uh, that that's just how it looked like and then uh, do you have any hypothesis of what environmental variables can cause the diversity of stingless bees? Well, it's it's probably the they are so poor dispersers. So just just having this dynamics of of the rivers uh, gives them uh, uh, difficulties in crossing. So you have a maybe more pronounced speciation there because they they just they just. Uh, they just do not cross even uh, small bodies of water, for example. This inter isn't interesting you say that because it, 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 I've, I've not looked into it in any detail, but it does seem to me that stingless bees are really, most of them are really restricted in their distributions, right? Uh, well, because of that. Some are a little better at uh, distributing uh, being distributed some of them are complexes of the uh, species but uh, at least many of them have difficulties in in expanding as you can say and, and there are different explanations to that than and one would be the it's uh, they don't like the the honeybee just uh, take off the entire colony and fly off with the queen they can't do that they have a they have a very different dispersal mechanism making it difficult for them Okay, thanks. Um, and, and you'll be lots more people are you know, sending chats and, and, and comments about what a great talk it was, how much they enjoyed it. So thank you. Uh, from Brian Dykstra, uh, do you think Apis mellifera could, mellifera, right, the subspecies mellifera, could have a different impact on native bees compared to other Apis mellifera subspecies? Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to know, but uh, th there would be some indications at least that the uh, mellifera mellifera, the, the the dark bee, the dark honey bee, which is the northern, is a uh, is a bit later than than the actual one. So you you may say that the impact would be different because it, they they wouldn't be one of the first. Today you you see Apis mellifera together with the very first bumblebees because they are very early on. I think if the 
supposedly the dark is is a bit later on, so they wouldn't be competing for the for the very first salix uh, resources. But by all means, salix is so abundant here that that it's I don't really think there's a limitation on on salix pollen during the during that period. It's just so abundant in in this area. But I, I think there could be a differences and uh, that would be interesting. We also looked in, I didn't have time to explain it. We we actually went through all of the ads in our in our Danish uh, bee journal, historical ads for selling uh, queens and looked at which type of queen they were selling. And, uh, and it's, it's clear that uh, we haven't had the yellow one for a very long time and uh, and it, it it's it's something fairly fairly new but other than that the the biological differences of the different subspecies of apis is, is uh it's a chapter of itself because uh, apis is even if you look at the, you have you you have looked at stings and genitalia. Apis is, is just such a different bee from from all of the other ones that it's it's hard yeah. sometimes to uh, to uh, understand it properly. It requires a specialization within Apis to to say much about them. So I I I, I can't really dwell too much into it. It's it's just a that's a bizarre bee, if we can say that for the type. <laughs> right. Yes. And everybody thinks all bees are like apis, whereas the opposite is true. Almost no bees are like apis. Uh, so some people are asking for your contact information so they can reach out to you to discuss projects and stuff. And so Victoria yeah, was yeah, sent well, out um, that. I, I added that there and uh, otherwise, yeah. uh, I think we're only a few thousand uh, Klaus Rasmussen in Denmark, but if you say Klaus Rasmussen <laughs> and B, then you can probably uh, locate me uh, and uh, or write Aarhus University next to my name, it should come up. <laughs> yeah, we've got quite a few Rasmussen's in Canada too, actually. Okay, yeah, my ancestors went out probably. Okay, are there any more questions for Klaus? Otherwise, please, I put my uh, email in the, oh, I did it uh, in a it direct in message chat. to you, but uh, let me, uh, and also Victoria added my uh, link to my pure profile. I think uh, the pure profile is there. Uh, uh, I can I, I can share that, uh, but otherwise uh, just 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 Google it. But the uh, the pure file is uh, how we uh, uh, they keep track of us at the university. So that's uh, everything is recorded there, and I I. I uh, right, you should be easy enough to find. Uh, oh, there we are, Agro LDK. <laughs> All right, there we are. Jolly good. So, I, yeah, you know, I think you know, a landscape genetic study of, of some stingless bees would be really interesting. And the, their wing morphology is is what you might expect. Of a, of, of a group of bees that in their origin, in the, in the stem group that led to them, they must have been incredibly small. Right? Exactly. The only other hymenoptera exactly. with such reduced wings are these uh, wing venation, are these tiny little calcidoids and, and other parasitoids. So at one point in, in time, they just they expanded in size, but uh, of course they were, they were tiny and probably a nuisance for the dinosaurs to uh, crawling into the eyes and, uh, and, and really, uh, it's because when they they crawl on you, they they don't sting, and uh, they, it's just a very ticklish feel feel when you have uh, a few hundred bees uh, stepping over you and with their six small uh, feet. Right, I I can't imagine a sting working very well against dinosaurs. Yeah, so why? Thick why skin. They just reduced it. Very interesting. Strange little bees. Ah, okay, so thanks a lot for that. That was a really nice tour through your career so far. We'll tap you again in a few years so you can tell us what you've done in the in intervening time. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, Klaus, for that. And uh, we're taking December off. 
Um, we didn't think anybody would be interested in attending a talk on the last Wednesday of December because it's between Christmas and the new year. Uh, but in next January, we have Thomas Wood talking about resolving outstanding alpha taxonomic problems in old world Andrina. Uh, that should keep us busy. Uh, February, we've got John Asher talking about, be, uh, talking about global patterns in bee diversity. Uh, March is still up for grabs, if anybody would like to give a talk next March. And in April, I think uh, we've got a Brazilian giving a talk to us then. So thank you all for coming. Um, I wish everybody a marvelous, silly season that's coming up. Uh, those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, go out and catch some bees. Those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, I wish you a warm few months and we're all looking forward to spring. So thank you very much for coming and uh, we'll see you in the same place, same time in two months time. And thanks very much to you, Klaus. And hopefully I'll see you in person again one of these decades. Okay, you can just be in Peru next week. I'll be there collecting with David Rubik. So uh, we're waiting for you. Uh, my students go into Peru soon, but uh, say hi to Dave from me. Will do. Bye Thanks, Liz. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Victoria.